Thanks everyone for joining us and welcome to our first virtual media and entertainment keynote. This has been an incredibly challenging year and everybody in the media and entertainment world has felt the impact deeply, regardless of whether you're in film and TV, games or design viz, it has touched everyone and challenged everyone. And while remote work and distributed teams have been a part of media and entertainment for production for some time, the current pandemic has dramatically accelerated these trends. They're now commonplace for everyone. All of us have to reimagine what's possible. And even though live action shoots and motion capture sessions will continue to restart over the coming months, we recognize that media and entertainment will be forever changed. At the same time, audiences out there crave the entertainment that content creators like you provide. If anything, we've seen just how vital these stories and experiences are in times like this. Now more than ever, we crave escape and imagination. Today, I'll share with you the trends we see unfolding in these crazy times and where we might go from here. And I'm not alone. Later, my colleague, Sarah Hodges, Associate VP of Product, will join us to talk about the products and initiatives we're working on, bringing the production and the creative side closer together to help you achieve the new possible. But let's start with the here and now. Even though COVID has been a focus of our lives recently, it can't match the irresistible force of the content boom. The content boom has been building for decades, riding the waves of online development with milestones in the halcyon days of video games, early computer graphics, and the internet. Just consider the changes to content that we've seen. 20 years ago, we had no YouTube, no Twitch, no eSports, no Netflix streaming, although I do recall putting plenty of Netflix DVDs in the mailbox. Since then, entire new media types have emerged. Animated features and stories are a good example, no longer the realm of children's content. Animation is finding wider audiences and is maturing to include material for everyone, young and old alike, whether comedy or drama. And just in the last year, we've seen new animation studios emerge and existing visual effects houses like Weta and Braun Digital retool to meet the demand for compelling animated content. And this will only continue. We're also seeing animation, visual effects, and gaming converge with techniques like virtual production becoming more and more mainstream. Lucasfilm's Emmy award-winning Disney Plus series, The Mandalorian, is a prime example. I love the Star Wars world in episodic Western serial form. So these techniques leverage classic special effects combined with cutting edge technology, all in service of new stories being told. And in gaming too, the content boom continues to have an impact, which I'm witnessing in real time in my living room as my kids play Apex Legends and Smash Brothers every night. So, as we wait eagerly for the next generation of consoles to drop later this year, and for online game streaming services to mature, game audiences and gaming appetites continue to grow, challenging game developers to produce deeper, richer worlds populated with more characters and more intelligence. Now, gaming technologies have also been pushed into the workplace, particularly due to the pandemic. We and our avatars can now collaborate in 3D, not just in new VR and AR applications, but also while hanging out in Minecraft, Fortnite, and Roblox. And we're seeing the rapid normalization of collaboration in 3D across a wide range of demographics. To borrow from William Gibson, the metaverse is here, it just isn't evenly distributed. And most importantly, in the worlds of gaming, film and TV, and design viz alike, audience expectations continue to grow. Audiences are much savvier and they demand more. They demand film quality and not just in the latest Marvel Avengers movie, but everywhere. So production values and quality must continue to rise to meet their expectations. And as production values go up, so do the challenges for studios large and small. Consider Hollywood blockbusters. Gone are the days of a single large VFX facility being able to handle a tentpole production solo. Now it's routine to see 10 or more studios being called together to meet the needs of the modern blockbuster, with the recent Spider-Man Far From Home tapping over 20 studios. Think about that, 20 studios working together on the same film. So we can think of the content boom as a multiplier across all of media and entertainment. Content creators like you are under tremendous pressure 
to deliver better and more, often with less time. This pressure to achieve the new possible is now greater than ever. But the challenges that come with it are not new. Whether it was the first halting forays into VFX or CG feature animation, the need for scale was present early on. And while our colleagues in other industries like architecture, engineering, and construction, as well as product design and manufacturing, have more recently digitized and shifted to a data-centric model, media and entertainment has embraced these concepts for a long time, even before we had the luxury of global connectivity at our fingertips. Since the first digital assets emerged, clay models being transformed into polys and NURBs, media and entertainment has wrestled with those most basic atomic level questions of production. What is an asset and how do we move it through production most efficiently? This was the dawn of the production pipeline. The media and entertainment industry understood the importance of data gravity. Pipelines that could scale were at a distinct advantage, allowing for management of large production data sets. But these same pipelines did not allow for effective collaboration. Today's studio workflows must become more and more collaborative, and this will accelerate into the future. So we need connected pipelines that support streamlined, efficient collaboration. At Autodesk, we think of this as production in the cloud, and there's no one better equipped to tell you about it than my wonderful colleague and shotgun product enthusiast, Associate VP of Product, Sarah Hodges. Thank you, Ben. Production in the cloud is where we are heading. It's going to solve the dance of production, the choreography of workflows between artists, producers, supervisors, and everybody in between, and across pre- and post-production. Fundamentally, it's all about managing the flow of creative and technical processes and unlocking efficiencies throughout the pipeline and the full production process. It's about scaling up, and down with ease, keeping data in context and connecting teams regardless of their geographical location, all in the cloud. For that, we have to innovate from the very beginning of the production process because it all starts in pre-production. And at the beginning of a story lives the edit, from rough cut, storyboards, concept art to rough cuts. But unfortunately, the flow of information from the editorial department through to other departments is not always ideal. A good example is the broken cut. I know you know what I'm talking about. When nobody knows if a shot has been changed or not, there's nothing worse than wondering, did my shot get dropped? Did we lose any frames? Did we need to change the timing of the character? Entire departments waste time and resources working on something that's no longer relevant. This drastically impacts the bottom line. That's why we're bringing the story into Shotgun, so that those of you working as artists, production coordinators, and managers can understand the story in context. So how do we do this? By leveraging open standards to bring the true context of the story from the moment dailies are being pulled together through to the delivery of the final product. As this exciting proof of concept shows you, you'll be able to access and review your work in context of the current edit. You can respond immediately, ensuring that you make the best creative decision informed by the current state of the product. The right information is delivered and accessible to you right when you need it. With this, we close the caps between important artistic decisions, keeping critical stakeholders and contributors in sync on the edit. But in order to truly connect pre and post-production processes and workflows, we need the power of the entire ecosystem. And there are many others out there who share this mission of forging these important connections. A good example, entertainment technology company, X2X. X2X has created a bespoke solution to get onset data and editorial data into Shotgun using Adobe Premiere Pro. And with that onset data in Shotgun, 
we can provide better insights by allowing you to manage the review and approval process all the way upstream. Companies like X2X, Adobe, and Autodesk are committed to forging such connections. Connections that mean enormous increases in efficiency. Award-winning independent VFX editor John Carr says it well, describing an early version of the integration of Shotgun, X2X, and Premiere Pro together. It was just incredibly time-saving. The only thing I can equate it to is magic. It will help a lot of people and make this process much smoother. As part of building the ecosystem around Shotgun, it is critical for us to embrace open and secure standards. Openness empowers collaboration and consistency, while security empowers trust. In the case of story and context, where an entire team may be involved in production decisions, Shotgun is leveraging Open Timeline I.O., or OT I.O. And at Autodesk, we believe that we must adopt and champion open and secure standards across all our products and all parts of the production process. Open standards unlock enormous benefits, both for individual artists as well as for studio teams. They unlock scalability and automation. So we're proud to be the founding and premier members of the Academy Software Foundation, part of the Linux Foundation, and the heart of the open source development for the media and entertainment industry. We have been part of this effort for years, and our support will continue into the future. And central to this collaboration is USD. USD, Universal Scene Description, is perhaps the best known of the open standards. Scene description files have been part of production for years, many proprietary, some based on hacks of existing file formats. But Pixar saw the need for a true universal scene description format, and we were one of the first companies they approached when launching it. So we've spent the last several years working closely with them to develop our Maya USD integration, particularly with all of you, pipeline TDs, technical artists in mind. Integrating Maya with USD is something we wanted to get right, and we have worked diligently to do so. We made significant changes to Maya's underlying architecture, providing a robust data agnostic foundation that makes it easier to integrate new standards and optimize performance going forward. Maya's addition of animation caching, started with Maya 2019, is one of the most recent benefits of this update resulting in stunning performance and productivity gains. And USD brings many more benefits to Maya. Consider some of the massive scene files that artists handle on a routine basis. Let's see it in action through one of my daughter's favorite animated Pixar characters. A nine gigabyte scene like this one from Finding Dory would have taken a lot longer to open in the past. Now, it opens in three seconds. And here too, we can see incredibly fast load times on a huge scene where we use Bifrost to scatter assets. But what this shows you is yet another enormous benefit of the USD integration, native USD editing. You can now edit and manage complex scene lines and files easily. And that's our goal, to make it feel easy. Working with USD files should feel comfortable allowing you to manipulate and edit USD natively and stay in the flow. You can be more productive, creating more compelling imagery, all enabled by USD. This Maya USD integration is the product of a collaborative development effort with some of the top studios in the industry. They have leveraged earlier versions of USD plugin capabilities in Maya on a wide range of projects you've already seen on screens big and small. And with the latest Maya release, more users will be able to take advantage of the power of USD. And USD is not the only open standard we are embracing. We are going far beyond that. A critical open standard for film and TV, but really all of the media and entertainment industry, is Material X. Here, we're working with industry leaders like Industrial Light and & Magic and Adobe Substance to build robust, 
reliable material, and look dev interoperability across our digital content creation tools and renderers. We're embracing Material X in Arnold, Maya, 3ds Max, with even more Autodesk tools to come. And open standards are not just about film and TV, but they are also about design visualization and e-commerce. E-commerce has always played a huge role in the content boom. However, with COVID, it's experiencing an even greater surge in momentum. As we all know, retail is now very much online, and online shopping has become a truly interactive experience, relying more and more on rich 3D content. To be honest, I was one of those people who thought that using AR technology to place 3D models of furniture in my home was a little bit over the top. But with COVID and the increasing quality of these experiences, I have changed my mind completely. Now, the e-commerce industry is looking towards proven media and entertainment technology for inspiration with moving assets smoothly through a content pipeline to meet these new demands. Modelers, look dev artists and animators listening in today, you'll be excited to hear that we are working closely with the Kronos 3D commerce and 3D formats working groups embracing their GLTF standard. By adopting their modern publishing standards in an upcoming beta release, we will enable you to meet the stringent visual demands of photorealistic real-time rendering with a best-in-class authoring toolset, as well as a viewport that inspires confidence. Because we know you live in the viewport. And we want you to move through your projects with fewer iterations and more confidence in the preview. The results will be final assets that greatly improve consumer experience. Whether GLTF or USDZ, these standards power web and AR experiences that bring e-commerce to the next level. All of this will help retail platforms like Ikea or Wayfair to consume and display assets in a reliable and repeatable manner because they have to create 3D assets for a huge range of different use cases. They have to digitize and process thousands of 3D assets often with hundreds of variations in SKUs, makes, models, and colors. So more than ever, they need to be able to coordinate and customize their processes and workflows and scale their production. So besides embracing GLTF, we've also been working hard on bringing 3ds Max to Forge. That's Autodesk cloud-based developer platform. We wanted to connect it and customize processes that until now have been mostly siloed. 3ds Max can now be used in conjunction with Forge and a host of different Autodesk and third-party applications to support all of you developers and technical artists in streaming and automating complex workflows. This has been difficult to manage manually, but it's ideal for the cloud. Imagine being able to automate the processing of photogrammetry data into a range of usable data sets for different needs, or being able to ingest and retopologize geometry data for a range of use cases on the fly made possible in an upcoming release. Or you can automatically process and bake texture data for entire asset libraries. This reduces complexity allowing your asset to perform in a real-time context and be displayed with greater visual richness. So 3ds Max on Forge enables powerful ways to repurpose assets for a vast array of uses, allowing you to process thousands of variations concurrently and achieve outcomes with best-in-class quality. And optimizing processes is not just relevant in e-commerce. Creating and scaling custom tools and FX work in production has been a continuing challenge for many studios. Custom tools are often the secret sauce that let a studio take their work to the next level, delivering truly unique experiences. But even though custom tools have always been a part of production, they have long been the domain of dedicated developers or technical directors. But the next iteration of Bifrost is going to enhance the work of all of UTDs, generalists, and FX TDs. Now, many of you know Bifrost, but you know it as a simulation tool. Incredibly capable, able to simulate things like explosion, fluid effects, and a huge range of complex natural phenomena. And indeed, it does all of that. But Bifrost is more than an FX tool. 
It's a rich, high-performance visual programming environment that allows you the incredible flexibility of using pre-built, out-of-the-box effects. It now also provides incredible customizability that doesn't compromise performance. Bifrost lets you innovate with your own tools, whether procedural effects, modeling, or rigging. And it gives you the ability to easily share your tools with your community, supercharging the production process. And for an upcoming Bifrost release, we're working on an even deeper integration with Maya's capabilities, which opens the door for exciting tools like high-performance scatter. Now, technical artists are not the only ones who are looking to optimize their processes. We know that all of you working as producers, production managers, and coordinators are too. With the content boom, production scheduling remains a grand challenge. The film and TV and games industries need to plan the creation of more content than ever before. And they require the scheduling of ever more complex workflows, all while optimizing the resources needed. This quote from Leica illustrates the problem well. We hit a wall. We were trying to iterate the schedule with dependencies in place, and it was taking weeks. Now, it's not just Leica who's facing this problem. All big studios today need creative agility to plan and replan quickly, as well as at scale. So we are very excited to share that we are bringing machine learning to production planning with genitive scheduling in Shotgun, currently in early testing. Imagine being able to create scheduling scenarios and have the software generate schedules and resource plans that reflect your dependencies and time constraints and are actionable for production. This allows you to assess and explore alternatives and adapt them to meet your requirements more easily than ever before, all driven by your production needs. For those of you working as producers and production managers, this will make a manual and difficult process both controllable and dynamic. It will empower you to plan faster with greater accuracy and agility. And again, open standards are fundamental for all of this, for connecting and customizing processes, but also for connecting ecosystems, facilitating new kinds of collaboration and synergies. Because technology supporting open standards can be leveraged beyond traditional media and entertainment use cases with crossover into architecture, engineering, construction, as well as product design and manufacturing. An exciting example of the ecosystem effect is our partnership with NVIDIA and their Omniverse platform. Omniverse is built on USD and connects our solutions, including Maya, 3ds Max, and Revit to third-party solutions that you rely on, like Esri, Unreal, Unity, SketchUp, and Rhino. Omniverse enables synchronous, real-time collaboration, allowing professionals using different tools to contribute to a project while observing their collective effort in a single view. With this, individuals and teams across disciplines, even from different industries, can work together in a completely new way in one single environment. You can now even collaborate on projects across AR, VR environments, using workflows in Maya and 3ds Max to directly edit and manipulate large data sets. So we are thrilled to collaborate with NVIDIA and the Omniverse platform and can't wait to see what you will do with it. But whether it's NVIDIA Omniverse, Unity or Unreal, we're committed to continued innovation and collaboration with our partners so that you can work in the real-time environment that best suits your content needs. Now, real-time collaboration is a big part of connecting studios and ecosystem but there are still a lot of roadblocks in production that make it hard for distributed studios to collaborate efficiently. A challenge that we know many of you have as pipeline TDs, developers, and production managers is how you manage and share assets across your teams, across your studios, and across distributed productions. In every single customer meeting I have been in before and during COVID, we have talked about asset management it still remains a technical hurdle to unlocking efficient workflows. So I'm delighted to announce that we will continue to ramp up investment in order to bring full-featured, secure, open standard-based asset management into the cloud. To make this leap to network studios in the cloud 
we are bringing rich asset management features to our Forge platform. And this year, we started to build the necessary infrastructure. Imagine you're leveraging a platform that understands all the data that you need for working on your shot, such as the cut that you're working in or the approved version of the model for an asset you're supposed to use. The platform automatically builds, updates your scene file with all of its dependencies. Now imagine someone else is working on the same asset or even another asset in your scene. The platform manages their changes for you, incorporating them, updating the scene, or preserving your own work. And by the time you're ready to share your work, the platform helps inspect it. It makes sure the right versions of all the assets are included, that your pipeline quality checks are done before sharing, and it notifies everybody further downstream. This is what it means to be truly connected. We are calling this rich feature set asset lifecycle management. For now, this is a proof of concept, but we are working hard on getting it into the hands of our beta testers. So all of these efforts get us closer to where we want to be. We want to help you manage and coordinate your processes, customize and adapt them to meet your needs, and forge meaningful connections between teams, studios, and ecosystems. We want to free your time to work on those amazing stories that we all crave, particularly in times like this. Now, we will bring this story to life through the eyes of one of our customers, a company that's at the forefront of creating amazing stories by empowering their full team of artists, producers, and supervisors to work together using much of what I have shared with you today. You've already seen a glimpse of them in Andrew's keynote. The company I am talking about is Leica. And today, we have their VFX supervisor, Steve Emerson, here with us in conversation with Ben. So Ben, back over to you. Steve, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. It's been, I don't know, a bit since uh, since we last worked together. So great to have you. Um, as a visual effects supervisor at Leica, um, I wanted to start out with a little bit of your backstory, you know, and um, you know what what got you to Portland, Oregon. There was a look at Leica night where uh, Henry Selleck was screening a film of his. It was a, a short film called Moon Girl. I'm mm -hmm. sure you remember Moon Girl. Yep. They were in production on Coraline, and they mm -hmm. decided that they were going to do a significant amount of cosmetic work on the puppets. Yeah. And specifically, they were doing replacement animation using 3D printing with the faces. Mm -hmm. And because of the way that they were going about it, uh, there was a seam line that spanned the puppet's faces horizontally. Yeah. And there was a lot of debate about whether or not they were going to clean up that seam line. They, they had made the decision they were going to do it. And within a couple of days, they were doing this look at like a night. And then I was shaking everybody's hands. And then I had the background and experience to take that task on. Right. I did some interviews. And like two weeks later, I was there, you know, a comping with Shake. And they gave me a team to lead. And uh, I've never left. Right you know, into the Here breach. I am 13 years later, I'm, I'm still there at Leica, yeah. So Leica just, I think this this year or recently celebrated their 15th anniversary. Yeah. And I guess it's been five features now from mm -hmm. Coraline to Missing Link. But what, what do you see has been the biggest evolutionary changes in the process? The scope of the films has grown enormously. Mm -hmm. We want to push stop motion as far as we possibly can. Yeah. We want to realize the potential of stop motion storytelling. And we're able to do that by leveraging technology. Uh, and then that's that's really where visual effects comes into the mix with a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, we, we try to pursue everything in camera as much as we can. But then when it comes to a point where we start to run out of resources, yeah. then we talk about whether or not visual effects is appropriate in order to be able to enable that storyteller. When you talk about scale and scope, mm -hmm. how many different um, sets are you running at a given time, just to give people an idea of 
what are we talking about? Like 25, 30? I think roughly, or? yeah, it was about, there, there are 25 animators right. that are all working on a film at a given time. So mm -hmm. the 25 animators are going on 25 sets, but then they have additional sets that are being set up for them so um, they can go, as soon as they finish animation on one set, they jump to another Right. and work on that set, and then they jump back. So, so you've got parallels. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So 25 animators, 50 sets wow. that are available to be right. working on. But on Missing Link, I, from what I remember, I don't remember the exact number, but I think it got up pretty close to 90 active sets that were happening during wow. that production because it was so massive. Mm -hmm. The puppets that, that you guys are creating and that, um, that you're working with, um, these are pretty complex armatures. Mm -hmm. How does the sort of armature and character design process flow? All right, I'm gonna do my best for you here. All right, because yeah, I'm, I'm like after the fact computer guy. But right. th this is how I understand the process and, and how I'm in the mix with a lot of this. Yes, 100% it starts on paper. Yeah. So different perspectives uh, with 2D art. Yep. That is then translated into a digital sculpt. Mm -hmm. Once that digital sculpt is approved by the director and we know what the character is gonna look like, yep. First thing they do is they take off all its clothes. So then we have a we have a, a nude character right. that is then neutralized and T-posed. Yeah. And then that'll get handed off for molding and casting. T-posed character, it's also it's gonna head over to the armature team. Right. That's basically it's the it's the skeleton within the body of a stop motion puppet, mm -hmm. right? It's what's gonna enable the the stop motion animator to be able to control it, to pose it frame by frame by frame. Right. But what they'll do is they start off with a layout task in Inventor. And when they're doing the, the layout, that's a lot of um, taking different types of modular components and then seeing what they're going to need to use in terms of like, you know, balls and sockets and joints right. uh, to be able to create a given armature or if they need to create something that's going to be custom or bespoke. You basically have kind of like an armature library, a parts library. You might pull from that library, but you have the ability to basically design and fabricate custom sure. custom parts as you need them. Is that the sort of thing that it's pretty typical where you're gonna have to do custom fabrication on every show for, for a character? So in the end, a lot of those armatures, they're, they're composites of the modular components, the custom components. Um, they're all brought together. Some of them need to be machined. They're on site, mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously somebody will, will take all of those components, they will solder them all together, uh, create the armature, and then slip it into a nice cozy uh, silicon body sleeve uh, in order to be able to drive a puppet performance. So if you have to turn out a new facial pose, how quickly can you go from the shape in Maya to a finished print? What's the, you know, I mean, Oh, how long does it take for them to turn around a face? Yeah. From that moment where the director looks at that sculpt in Maya and says, okay, that, that's the character from the, for the film. From that to a puppet being carried out to set that's animation ready, uh, that's nine months. Mm -hmm. So nine months to manufacture the puppet. Mm -hmm. In terms of the faces, the turnarounds, you know, it's kind of an overnighty, kind of one day sort of a thing. With those characters where you have multiple physical characters that are shot in camera versus characters that are digital, um, is this character going to be a digital one? And it's going to stay digital, sure. or are we going to, you know, try to pull this off as a as a physical character? Um, and then, you know, I guess the related question is, um, how do you, you know, how do you finesse the look to sell the entire image with the with you know characters that are basically, you know, right up against each other and sure. digital physical? Over the past fifteen years, we have we've developed a set of rules. Mm. Uh, and uh, for instance, if it is a lead character in the film, uh, if it's a speaking character, uh, the, those are, are almost always hand animated stop motion puppets. Mm -hmm. If another character is coming into physical contact with a stop motion puppet, uh, directly is the focus of a shot, is touching that puppet, mm -hmm. that will also be a hand animated stop motion puppet. The environment, the direct environment around the stop motion puppets yeah. and those performances are physical, real world environments. Once we move beyond the immediate environment, the, the hero performance, the focus of the shot, and anything that is affecting or touching that, that character, yeah. 
and so all bets are off. Mm -hmm. We want to get as much in camera as we possibly can. Yep. And we will always strive to do that to the point where we start to run out of resources to the point where it's going to affect a storyteller's vision. And that's where I come into the discussion. And yep. I say, okay, this is what we can provide and this is what we're gonna need to do that. Th those are pretty much the rules. If we get it in camera, we will. Hero performances, always puppets. If there is immediate direct contact, those are gonna be hand animated puppets as well. So it's a different type of production management process than a traditional live action visual effects picture sure. or, or certainly like a standard live action shoot. What are some of the um, you know, production management challenges that you have managing something like this where you've got you know, 50 stages plus running sure. and a team of visual effects artists? And that seems scary just thinking about it. <laughs> sure, so you're getting at bottlenecks pretty yeah. much here is what you're talking about. All right, so the first and most obvious is animation. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing it one frame at a time. And the, these uh, stop motion animators, they work at a clip of roughly three and a half to five, maybe six seconds a day. Easiest way for me to think about it is we're getting a second a day out of each of those animators. Okay. That's a big bottleneck. Everything's gotta be built. And when you build it, there's only one. And when it's just, if there's one of whatever the heck it is, if it's a puppet or if it's an environment, and there's one camera and there's one animator that's got those resources, mm -hmm. they're being left alone for weeks in order to be able to get this stuff done. So right. that's a big one. And then certainly when you compare stop motion versus you know, a CG animated project, or even live action, when you're talking about helping to, to create photorealistic environments, um, if you have a puppet, you got one puppet, you want two, you're gonna have to wait another four months. You want three, okay, then that's eight months out unless you're gonna staff up and bring more people on. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about digital assets for a CG production, or if they're gonna complement a live action visual effects production, that's control C, control V. You can, you can, you can create more duplicates of those that can go out to other anima right. animators and other shot artists. You don't have to actually build those. Same goes for the environments. So really, it's, it's, it's a huge undertaking in terms of production management mm -hmm. because every last thing needs to be built. And beyond that, if you want to duplicate it, it's going to take weeks, months. And so you're running pretty much the, uh, the whole production process through Shotgun as your, your main production management tool? We adopted Shotgun after Coraline, and honestly, I don't know how we lived without it. <laughs> like in the Coraline days, there were three by five cards on cork boards, there was Microsoft Project, there were Excel spreadsheets, there were, there were, there were schedules, there was information everywhere. And um, Shotgun, we adopted it moving into Paranorman and it, it immediately made everything much simpler in terms of you organization You were early adopters for sure. Yeah, that was 2010, I think mm -hmm. we brought it in, right about then. Yeah, so it really, it certainly transformed everything for us, especially in visual effects, and now it's it's certainly being used studio-wide. And I know that that you've got teams who are using some of the new, uh, still still early features, I think beta features of, with generative scheduling. Has yeah. that been, been working well from what you've seen? Yeah, that's very exciting. My understanding is that there is an early prototype generative scheduling tool that has been integrated into scheduling uh, for the puppet department and for the uh, set fabrication department mm -hmm. at Leica. Next in line is gonna be visual effects. Mm -hmm. We're still early on with our planning for our next film. Uh, what was it that I was told? I was given actually some data. It was 12,000 tasks that involved 60 unique resources. And you're tracking and managing all that. Yeah, through. and this is, I believe, it was through it was through the puppet department. Uh huh. And they were able to using generative scheduling that they were able to level that schedule. It was like within a matter of minutes. Wow. So, to me, yeah, that's I I I can't wait to to start to have a play and see what our production management team can From do. From what with I've that seen, it's pretty awesome, and I think it's yeah. the sort of thing that you know will save uh, person years of producer and production management time. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, yeah. And with efficiency, it becomes efficiency becomes opportunity. Shifting gears a little bit, um, I know that there's been um, I think some some R and D efforts, and maybe it's already in production on with using uh, machine learning and AI as 
a way of, of doing rotoscoping, a roto process. Um, can you tell me a little bit, a little bit about how that's working? Sure. So obviously in visual effects community, AI, machine learning, that's been like a big buzzword here for the past couple of years. We always need mats mm -hmm. and we hate green screens. And to be able to, to rotoscope um, uh, entire silhouettes of characters, mm -hmm. I mean, that's something we're certainly going to try and pursue. Yeah. We use some pretty crazy rigging systems in order to be able to get these really subtle and nuanced performances out of these puppets to be able to get a machine to recognize those rigs mm -hmm. so we can hopefully paint them out in post-production and create mats for those very efficiently. Right, right. I think that's where we're headed is, is trying to, to uh, eliminate those types of tasks, which by the way, artists are crazy about doing, Yep. <laughs> that will enable them to be able to say, okay, the machine's gonna take care of it, it's gone. Now you just be an artist right. and make this into something really, really Focus cool. Focus on the stuff that, that they're gonna be excited about. Exactly, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've talked a little bit about some of the new tech that you guys are working on. We talked a little bit about uh, you know AR before the shoot. That seems like something that'd be a, a kind of a natural for on set, you know, assist, that kind of thing. What are, what are some of the tech pieces that you're looking at for the future? Sure, well, AR will definitely be a big part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about stop motion, there's never enough puppets, there's never enough sets. Uh, but we have a, a finite timeline in order to get a, a film done. And again, animation ends up being a bottleneck. So oftentimes we have to shoot performances on green screens. Mm -hmm. And those performances are being lined up in front of a camera and a director is being asked to sign off on a given shot and all they're seeing is a puppet and green screen. So what they'll end up doing oftentimes is they'll take uh, foam core cutouts um, of what would be like mm -hmm. a, an approximation of that environment, just to be able to frame something up so a director can feel comfortable buying off on it. But it's not precise, and and it's in a way it's 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 somewhat false in the reality of the, those cutouts. Um, AR for us being able to have a a digital representation of those sets, mm -hmm. and to be able to go out onto set, line up a puppet, and then remove those green screens on set and show a director what that environment really looks like, what that shot composition will be, mm -hmm. would be a game changer. Mm. And it's it's so obvious for us. And so I think it's inevitable that we're definitely gonna be using a lot of that on future productions and certainly on the next one that we're getting ready to get started on. Mm -hmm. The other one for me that I think I'm really interested in, Ben, is is just it's, I'm excited about real-time rendering. Um, I'm, ex I'm excited because uh, having like done this and you yourself, like we've done this for a long time and we know that when you're doing shot work and you're making films, those shots, they, they, they can always be better, right? Mm -hmm. You always yeah. want to make it better. Mm -hmm. Like how can we make this truly exceptional and visually beyond anything that audiences have ever experienced before? To me, that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, I, I, am, I am ready and willing and anxious to integrate that type of technology into our pipelines. Well, I'm excited to see what you're gonna do with this stuff. Yeah. Steve, always a pleasure to uh, talk movies, talk visual effects with you. Thanks for, for joining us. Uh, keep pushing the craft forward. And I'm definitely excited to see what you guys are working on next. Thank you, Ben. I'm excited to share it with you. We're very proud to have such a long-standing relationship with studios like Leica. And not just Leica, but all of the people using our technology. Our technology has been part of the media and entertainment industry for a long time. It's represented in every major VFX and animated feature going back to the 1980s. This industry is critically important to Autodesk, and we want to help it navigate the demands and opportunities of the coming decades as well. And for us, this is not just about solving the tough technical challenges that many of you are facing, but building the foundation for new ways of making. Ways of making that are fit for the trends that we see only accelerating into the future, shaping the entire entertainment ecosystem. This is why we're on a journey together to connect the entire production process in the cloud, bringing the production side and the creative side closer together. On the creative side, we're continuing to invest in our content creation tools. We're committed to pushing Maya and 3ds Max forward 
and we're not doing that alone. As you've heard from Sarah and Andrew, we are collaborating with the entertainment community on open standards and the opportunities that they bring. And through our partnerships with companies like NVIDIA, we want to strengthen the entire ecosystem because we know that more seamless and efficient collaboration with your peers is important. And it might as well pave the way for entirely new collaborations, even beyond the ecosystem you're a part of. And connected ecosystems rely on openness and collaboration on the most fundamental level. They rely on processes that are connected and customized in a meaningful way. This is why the customization of workflows in Maya and 3ds Max is so important to us. With solutions like Bifrost, we want to push the boundaries of what's possible in content creation. But more importantly, we want to give you the possibility to push those boundaries yourself. For us, this is not optional. The realities of production today demand innovation. You need to be able to improve your creative processes, but also manage them, unlocking efficiencies throughout your pipeline. Because production isn't just about making beautiful images, it's about successfully coordinating processes and workflows, guiding talented teams toward a shared vision. So we are committed to production in the cloud with efforts like story and context, generative scheduling and asset lifecycle management, building the foundation for connecting the entire production ecosystem. We want to enable the media and entertainment industry to be connected, collaborative and open. This industry has learned many lessons that others are facing just now. It's an engine of innovation, and we want to empower innovators like you to achieve the new possible and be a beacon for creators, even creators from different industries. Together with you, we want to continue pushing the boundaries. Together, we can reimagine possible.